God bless you, everyone. My name is Dave, and I'm here to tell you about Identity Crisis. We've been working on a series called Who Am I? So we're going to have a little chat about uh, an identity crisis. Um, the five basic agenda items are, what is an identity crisis? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And what to do about it? And most importantly, how God can help. We're going to talk about that. So what is the psychological definition of identity crisis? So let's start there for a moment. An identity crisis is a developmental event that involves a person questioning, questioning their sense of self or place in the world. The concept originates in the work of developmental psychologist Eric Erickson, who believed that the formation of identity was one of the most important conflicts that people face. Now, there are three th stressful things in life. I'm going to give you a, a little bit of an example. My mother, my mother told me that there are three most important stressful things that could cause an identity crisis. They are getting a new job, moving to a new home, or getting married. She told me your identity is how you identify yourself to the world, how you identify yourself to the world. And the crisis is the explosion when the world you identify yourself in caves in. The world she talked about is the one you created yourself. It's not the real world, and it's not God's world. If the world you live in doesn't work, it's because you don't work. If you can handle change, then you are living in the real world. Remember the three most stressful things in life that can cause an identity crisis that my mother talked about? Getting a new job, moving to a new home, and getting married. I did all of that in the first three weeks in October of 2002. <laughs> you see, God was there to help me through it because I was joined with my wife, and together we became one with God in the center as glue. We worked together in our marriage, preparing our new home, and being excited about a new job. That was almost 20 years ago. Nothing has changed. The job, though, is long gone, including the company. It's gone. Uh, I still live in the same home, and of course, I'm with Maria. And of course, God is still there. So let's talk about what is an identity crisis. Your identity is who you are, and a crisis is when you forget who you are. Let's say that again. Your identity is who you are, and a crisis is when you forget who you are. It's when the, the train derails and is off the rails. It's when the turnip falls off the truck and is lost. It's when a transgender woman is crowned Miss Nevada, USA at South Point Hotel and Casino Spa on Sunday, June 27th. So a boy won Miss Nevada, USA. Follow me yet? So he will compete for the Miss USA title in November of this year. He'll probably win. And people think that's normal and biblically okay. That's an identity crisis. Still follow me? Here are the examples of the result of an identity crisis. Men married, me, married men, I should say, married men dating other women and vice versa. Fancy lifestyles with debt and empty bank accounts. People not accountable for their actions. Making commitments without planning. Bruce Jenner to Caitlyn Jenner and people follow him or her, and he or she is running for governor too in California and will probably win. I'll tell you, my father taught me about identity and the changes in life. It's my father. He taught me this. He said a boy does what he wants to do, and a man does what he has to do. Either way, a boy, a boy turns into a man, not a girl. And I look like the crazy one as I talk about this, okay? 
Now, people without an identity crisis, let's talk about what people are like without an identity crisis. Number one, they earn respect. They don't demand respect. Uh, people without titles or don't advertise them. Uh, their lifestyle matches their bank account. Okay to rent and not hold a mortgage. They are connected with family and community. They have good character and integrity in community. They don't complain. Listen to how they speak. They are responsible. They hold themselves accountable. They never blame others. They accept correction. They are motivated, organized, and disciplined. They are on their A game. Now let's talk about the manifestations of identity crisis, the manifestations of identity crisis. A failed character that shows a lack of integrity. Examples are deception as an act of trickery, manipulation to steal from others, selfishness to self-satisfy at the expense of others. The actions of deception, manipulation, and selfishness stem from fear, intimidation, and jealousy. Okay, fear, intimidation, and jealousy. These are the ingredients to anxiety. The pharmaceutical companies make money on your anxiety, and I'm talking outside of medical situations. They don't tell you about the 333 rule. See, the first step is look around you and name three things you see. Number two, name three sounds you hear. And number three, finally, move three parts of your body, your ankle, your finger, your arm. Whenever you feel your brain going 100 miles per hour, this mental trick can help center your mind, bringing you back to the present moment. So let's talk about what does the Bible say about identity? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 8 tells us that knowing our identity in Christ will strengthen and help us live a victorious life here on earth. Let's read that, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now let's talk about, we use the word the people of. Say that, the people of. We use that a lot. We may speak of the people of Africa, the people of Asia, or of Europe. We may also narrow our focus and speak of the people of Brazil, or the people of China. When we speak of the people of, we are speaking of people belonging to a geographical location or ethnic group or some other characteristic that unites them. We, the church, belong to God. Our identity as a distinct people is that we belong to God without regard to race or sex or geographical location or time. As the one people of God, we should show forth the love of God to the other people of the world. And we see that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, where the scripture says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Now let's talk about going through an identity crisis, going through an identity crisis. It is important to note that an identity crisis is not an actual diagnosis. Rather, a person going through an identity crisis may find themselves preoccupied with certain questions. For example, what am I passionate about? What is my spiritual connection to God? What are my values and ethics? What is my role in society or purpose in life? Who am I? This question we have been talking about. Often we feel pressured to define ourselves through our jobs, financial status, successes, grades, appearances, what other people say about us, and many other means. But what happens to our identity when we experience failure or losing someone's favor or become burned out in our jobs or places of service? 
Let's talk about the changes affecting identity. People tend to experience them at various points through life, particularly at points of great change, including beginning a new relationship, ending a marriage or a partnership, experiencing a traumatic event, having a child, learning about a health condition, losing a loved one, losing or starting a job, moving to a new home. A stable sense of self cannot fully exist when we place our, our identity on external things. When circumstances change, our identity constantly changes too. It's developmental through our journey and growth. We may receive an overwhelming amount of messages telling us to define ourselves by external measures. But what would it look like to base our identity on the way God sees us? Think about that. Now let's talk about a new identity in Christ. Let's talk about that, a new identity in Christ. One of the richest passages about identity in the Bible is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14. In this passage, the Apostle Paul addresses the church in Ephesus, explaining the new identity given to a person when they are in Christ. According to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We have been chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, grace lavished, and unconditionally loved and accepted. We are pure, blameless, and forgiven. We have received the hope of, the, of spending eternity with God. When we are in Christ, these aspects of our identity can never be altered by what we do. Often, however, a gap exists intellectually knowing these truths about who God says we are and living them out. This can be affected by how we see ourselves, life experiences, and the ways we allow the world to define us. In order to live out of the fullness of our new identity in Christ, we must determine what hinders us from doing so. That varies from person to person. Often a false belief has wedged itself between how God defines us and seeing ourselves in the same light. For example, the opposite of pure and blameless would be impure, stained, or guilty. Perhaps a life experience has caused you to feel impure, so you believe God sees you this way. You then create and live out an identity based on your actions, which is contrary to how God sees you. In order to fight against these false beliefs, we must discover the exact belief we are allowing to negatively form our identity. Now, let's talk about challenging false beliefs about yourself, all right? Challenging false beliefs about yourself. Once you recognize a false belief, surrender it to God. Turn away from it by choosing not to agree with it. Then replace the lie with the truth found in Scripture. Sometimes the lie is connected to a very real painful experience. Take some time to grieve over the experience and invite God into the place of brokenness. After you have surrendered the lie over to God, pray that he will help you believe the truth about who he says you are and make you aware of times you do not believe it. We may not always feel forgiven or blameless, but the truth is God sees us that way. This is where faith comes in. Again, I'll say that again. We may not always feel forgiven or blameless, but the truth is God sees us that way. This is where faith comes in. In 2 of Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Again, that's 2 of Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And again, that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Now let's talk about 
Let's talk about this. How does God see you? If we live out of an identity based on how God sees us, we no longer feel we need to find our worth in our external circumstances. It frees us up to live confidently and stably instead of changing who we are based on the opinions of others, our professional successes, or how we see ourselves, and all the other ways we define our significance. It gives us the opportunity to experience God's unconditional love in new and fresh ways. And it allows us to confidently and boldly share his love with others. It is certainly a battle as we live in a world that seeks to define us by its own standards. But the battle is worth it because as we fight it, the world around us changes. How would believing the truth about your new identity in Christ change the way you live? Think about it. Try to catch it. Again, how would believing the truth about your new identity in Christ change the way you live? Let that one soak in for a moment. Now let's talk about how we can know our future self. Let's know our future self. One way to feel more secure in your sense of self and more confident in who you want to be is to practice visualizing your best possible future self. Be guided by the Holy Spirit. Be guided by the Holy Spirit. Imagine your life in the near future, focusing on specific aspects of your life that will have gone as well as possible. Let that vision of your life be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. That means to put God in the center of your life and your future. Listen to what God is telling you. Think about ways to make the vision you have for yourself become a reality. Recall the future you've imagined anytime you feel stuck or otherwise lost in life. And use it to center yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you with this. What future does God have for you? How is your future aligned with God's purpose for you? What are you ready for? The values you hold on to are central to who you are as a person. They help shape your identity in many ways. One of the easiest ways to find a sense of purpose in life is to always embody the values that you hold dear. If being kind and compassionate are part of your values, then find ways to practice kindness and compassion every day. If fostering a sense of community is one of your values, then get to know your neighbors and try to organize a monthly get-together, whatever that may be. Now let's talk about recovering from loss or change, because that affects our identity too, recovering from loss or change. Loss and change can be devastating, but they can also offer us new opportunities to evaluate who we are and what we are doing. Chances are your goals and dreams are different now than they were five or 10 years ago. And yet you may have become blind to that change because of a habit or circumstance. Anytime you suffer a loss or sun change, use it as an opportunity to reassess and reevaluate your life. Do the positive thing. Many people see the passing of a loved one as a wake up call to do the things differently or stop putting it off. Uh, stop putting off long-term goals. Live life. Be part of it. When my brother Jim, he died at the age of 28 years old. This was years ago in, in, in a car accident. The published article in the Boston Globe shook my reality of what life is. This is back in a time when uh, the passing of a loved one could be posted in the media and the next of kin would find out later. Well, that newspaper article was written testimony of the value of life. I put effort into my master's degree. I started a business. I put focus on contribution. It changed my direction. I started to live life. A job loss can also be a wake-up call to find a new job that offers more happiness and, and fulfillment. Ask yourself honestly if your current goals and personal values are the same as they used to be. If they are not, find ways to incorporate your new goals and values into your life. A long time ago, I lost a job that I did not like. 
my part-time business became a full-time job. New doors have opened, and that is a testimony for another conversation another time. We'll talk about that later. Open it up to prayer. Let God be your mentor. Friends, family, and significant others are all sources of stability for many people. Having a strong connection with your family or friends can also help you feel more stable in terms of identity by giving you a sense of belonging. But keep God in the center. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, next, we're going to talk about how you can know yourself in Christ, to know yourself in Christ. Say to yourself, the spirit of God, who is greater than the enemy in the world, lives in me. First of John, chapter four, verse four says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And that's in first of John, chapter four, verse four. Now say to yourself, I have received abundant grace and the gift of righteousness and reign in the life through Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, the scripture says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now say to yourself, I have received the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus, the eyes of my heart enlightened, so that I know the hope of having life in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 18. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 18 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of the revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Say to yourself, I am renewed in the knowledge of God and no longer want to live in my old ways or nature before I accepted Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 through 10 says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new uh, self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And finally, say to yourself, I am chosen by God who called me out of the darkness of sin and into the light and, and life of Christ so I can proclaim the excellence and the greatness of who he is. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the scripture says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, we started talking about an identity crisis. This is what we talked about. And we said an identity crisis is a developmental event. Not, I'm not talking about the medical issue. It involves a person questioning their sense of self or place in the world. The concept originates in the work of developmental psychologist Eric Erickson. We talked about that, who believed that the formation of identity was one of the most important conflicts that people face. So what are the three characteristics of establishing an identity? Number one, defining oneself within the world. Number two, feeling a sense of belonging. And number three, feeling unique. How can you be connected? Well, let's find out. Number one, defining oneself within the world. You have a purpose. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And that is in Jeremiah 29, 11. And number two, feeling a sense of belonging. You are part of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 14. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 12 through 14. The scripture says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 14. And number three, feeling unique. We are all unique in each of our own way. And we 
hear about it in Psalms uh, 139, 14. That's chapter 139, verse 14 of Psalms. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And again, that's Psalms chapter 139, verse 14. So we are defined by this world with a sense of belonging and feeling unique. Now we can be with each other within the body of Christ. And we know this again in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. So as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So what was our agenda? What did we talk about? We talked about 15 different things. Number one, the three stressful things in life. Number two, what is an identity crisis? Number three, examples of identity crisis. Number four, people without an identity crisis. Number five, manifestations of identity crisis. Number six, what does the Bible say about identity? Number seven, going through an identity crisis. Number eight, changes affecting identity. Number nine, a new identity in Christ. Number 10, challenging false beliefs about yourself. Number 11, how does God see you? Number 12, how to know your future self. Number 13, recovering from loss or change. Number 14, know who you are in Christ. And finally, number 15, how you can be connected. So basically, what questions did we answer? Uh, What is an identity crisis? What does it look like? Uh, What does it feel like? What to do about it? And how can God help? Most importantly, God is in the center. You got to work on it, but it is done with God. Listen to the whispers of the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is about choice. You can enter an identity crisis. You can live through an identity crisis. And you can finally exit an identity crisis. Or better yet, you can avoid the identity crisis. It's a choice. And obviously, I'm speaking outside of specifically medically diagnosed situations. I'm not talking about hospital-related issues connected to the identity crisis. Now, let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, close your eyes and raise your hands. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Dear Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. You are welcome into my heart. Clean what needs to be cleaned. Organize what needs to be organized, throw out what needs to be thrown out, test me and know my anxious thoughts, mold me more into your image this day, help me never forget that I am your child, dear Lord, and that you are my father. Give me the strength and encouragement to carry out the business and the activities of the day and night. Guide me straight through your light. Protect my walk against the savages of this world. Be along my side. Hold me in your arms. I bless your holy name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you for joining me. My name is David, and this is the Resurrection Center.